but we look forward to that day when you're able to be here with us in worship. Before we read our scripture, I got some great news to share with you. I am excited to announce that beginning August 31st, we have a new associate minister that will be joining us here on staff, Cody Robertson. Cody will be coming here from Bentonville, Arkansas, where he's been on staff at First Christian Church. He is coming here with his wife, Ashley, and their five-year-old son, Carter. He is going to have a focus on spiritual development, leadership development, and reaching people younger than Jeff. <laughs> I was young pastor the day I got here after two and a half years. Look what you've done to me. But we are excited, so we'll have more opportunities to know about how to welcome them and uh, give them a hearty welcome here to Lindenwood and to Memphis in the next several weeks. But please be in prayer for their family, for their congregation that is losing him, as, and give us open arms to receive a new member of our staff to help lead us and to serve us. This time, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have, come, I've, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You may be seated, please. Three stories, all accurate, names withheld to protect the innocent and the guilty. She came into worship for the first time in a wheelchair, and an usher pulled her aside and said, wouldn't you feel more comfortable sitting over here, hidden, away from the people that will be worshiping today. Won't you feel more comfortable, separated from everyone else? A father was a deacon in the church for many years. Faithful man, loving husband, good father. He taught Sunday school. He helped out with the building. He was generous with his middle class income. But when his daughter, while in college, came out as gay, he embraced her, and the church removed him from all leadership in the church. A phone rang at the congregation that I served. Will you host a funeral for my family member? I have a cousin that died, and the church I attend will not host their funeral because when they were baptized, they were sprinkled and not immersed, and they don't think they're going to heaven. I could go on for 30 minutes of stories of this vein. I want you to raise the hand of your heart or raise your real hand if you know stories where church people hurt people, get those hands up. If you know where church people have hurt people, I call this bad religion. That's what we're going to talk about today and for the next several weeks. So for all of you who have been bruised by church, hurt by church, love people that have been hurt or bruised by church, or even as I have, you have hurt people in the name of church, these next few weeks are for you. We call this bad religion. Now let's be blunt here. 
religion is a loaded word, is it not? Religion is a heavy word. It is a loaded word. The most frequent statement I hear of people my generation and younger is, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. I get that. And I honestly avoid using the word religion, but the fact of the matter is religion is originally a good word that has earned a bad reputation. In fact, James 1.27 says, Good and pure religion is this, that you would care for the orphans and the widows and do everything you can to not be contaminated by the culture around you. That sounds like following Jesus, does it not? But I get that there is bad religion and there is bad imagery that comes from the term religion. So for our next several weeks, here's the operating imagery and language that I want us to all buy into. Bad religion breaks us apart. Good religion brings us together. Religion comes from the word ligament. Now, I am not, a, 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 I did not do well in biology. You know, you got the skeleton up there that points out all the body parts. But what I do know is this, ligaments are what hold everything together. And when scripture and tradition began to speak of religion, it spoke of something that was a ligament for humanity to each other and to God. Bad religion breaks our relationships with people and with God, and good religion ties us together as one human family and unites us to the God who created us and loves us all. Bad religion needs to be repented of. Not simply pointed out in others, but even acknowledged within ourselves. So to all of us that may be attached to religious customs, traditions, oughts and musts and shoulds, I need to give us all a big rude awakening. Jesus comes down like a wrecking ball on bad religion. Jesus had a lot to say. Now, if I was being creative, I would have sung Wrecking Ball. You all think I don't know what that song is. I could demonstrate it. I could wear what I need to wear. I could do that, but I'm going to spare everyone. Bud is giving me an amen from the front corner. We see what Jesus has to say about bad religion in Matthew 9, in this story that we read. We begin with this character, Matthew. Now, Matthew is a tax, tax collector, and it says that he is sitting at the tax collecting booth when Jesus, who he never interacted with, just comes strolling casually by. Now, one of the things I wish the Bible had was a soundtrack. Because every time the word tax collector is used, I want you to think of the Darth Vader soundtrack from Star Wars that begins to play. No one likes tax collectors. We don't like them then, and we don't like them now. Can I get one amen to that? <laughs> tax collectors are immediately a taboo, not simply because they work for the IRS and are just doing their job, but in biblical times, representing the Roman government, they could take what the government wanted, and they could take what they wanted and put it in their pocket, and there was zero recourse for what happened. No one liked tax collectors. But Jesus walks up to this person that he's not supposed to be talking to, that nobody likes, and Jesus is like, hey, I think we should be friends. And he says to him two words. Follow me. Jesus invites him to follow him. Now, Jesus, I, mean, I know this is going to sound like splitting hairs here, but stick with me because I'm stepping on bad religion. Jesus doesn't say get baptized the right way. Jesus doesn't say you need to be circumcised, as would be the custom for his faith. Jesus doesn't say you need to come to our church and join us. Jesus says, follow me. Never forget, it's not about Christianity, it's about following Jesus. That's what we're all about. And Jesus models this for Matthew. And Matthew, after hearing these two simple words, follow me, it says Matthew got up and followed him. He didn't even read the terms of the agreement when it came time to follow Jesus. There was something so powerful and profound when the Son of God locks eyes with you and invites you to experiencing something new. Now, I don't know where all this unfolds in the gap of the story, but you go from one verse to the next where Matthew stands up, walks off the job site, and the next verse says he's throwing a party. He's having a big house party. He's having a huge celebration 
and he invited all the wrong people. He invited all the wrong people. Now there's Jesus, there's his disciples, there's tax collectors, and then here's another word for you, sinners. Jesus is hanging out with all the wrong people. Tax collectors, sinners, disciples, son of God, put them in a blender. That's who Jesus wants to hang out with. Jesus did not care about his reputation among people who care about reputation. Jesus did not care about his reputation, of who he hung out with, of people that took notes about who you're supposed to be hanging out with and who you're not supposed to be hanging out with. And he does something that seems so secondary, so second nature to us, but is revolutionary in biblical times. Jesus is eating with them. Jesus is eating with them. Now catch this. In Jesus' times, when you sit down and share a meal with someone, that is conveying a sense of equality, embrace, and affirmation of their humanity. Tax collectors and sinners are not supposed to dine with you, to be embraced by you, to be welcomed by you. It would be guilt by association, but all of those that are guilt by association, Jesus said, pull up a chair and sit with me. I think we're going to have a good time tonight. Jesus is promiscuous in who he hangs out with. Tell all your friends that your pastor said Jesus was promiscuous. <laughs> Jesus was willing to cross boundaries that religion said no to. Jesus was willing to cross boundaries that religion said no to. Well, then the Pharisees... And the teachers of the law, they show up. And these are people that are not happy about what Jesus is doing. These are people that are not excited that Jesus is crossing boundaries. And they say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Write this one down. There is a difference between asking a question and being questioned. Jesus is being questioned. They're not asking out of curiosity. They don't want to learn more about the way of this wise teacher. They are questioning him. They are confronting him, but they don't even have the courage to do it to his face. They go to the disciples. We call that triangulation. We don't agree with Jesus, so we're going to put you on the spot. Whenever someone comes to me, oh, I'm going to get to preaching now. Whenever someone comes to me and says, now, Jeff, don't you think? They're not fishing for my interest and in ideas. They're looking for affirmation of their prejudice. I said that. I said what I said. Don't you think that is what is being put on display? And Jesus eavesdropping in on this collision of life with Christ and bad religion I imagine he stands up, arches his back, walks into a conversation he was not invited into, and drops the hammer. You know, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor, but the sick. You know, I didn't come for the righteous, but for the sinners. And he frames it in such a way that all of us have to answer these two questions. Am I healthy or am I sick? Am I righteous or am I a sinner? If I haven't gotten under your skin yet, here I am. If you are healthy, you don't need Jesus. If you think you're fine, you don't need Jesus. If you think you're righteous on your own, you don't need the gospel. Because the gospel is for sick people. The gospel is for sinners. And whether you believe it or not, that is all of us. And then Jesus, knowing the text, reached back into the Old Testament, pulled out Hosea 6.6, 6, and he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not arcane religious customs. I desire, oh, I am moving here. I desire mercy, not the way you've always done things. 
When it comes to human relationships, let's be bound together, not broken apart. Is anybody with me on that? The Lord himself announced and affirmed what the Old Testament had said so many years ago. It's all about God's mercy. And it's not about our merit. If you write anything down today, write this down. It's about mercy, not about merit. It's about mercy, not about your GPA before God. It is about mercy, not the big image that you put up in public and then go home and melt down behind closed doors. It is about mercy. But so many of us were raised to believe that our relationship with God was dependent on how good we were. Anybody grow up believing that? Let me just tell you, this is a false gospel. The whole book of Galatians is about this. Somewhere we get this idea and it gets distilled down to this. And I've heard this my whole ministry. I just pray when I die that I've done a little more good than bad and that God will let me in. Anybody ever thought that, said that, heard that? That is not Christianity! Sorry if I'm too excited about it, but it's a false gospel. You are never good enough, but you know who is? Jesus! It's about His mercy, not your goodness. It is about His mercy. God is enough, and we never are. And that gives me so much relief, comfort, and letting go of the burden of pretending I have it all together. It is about mercy, not merit. When I was in college, I had a scholarship that I did not deserve. Let me just get real blunt about that. I had a scholarship I did not deserve, and I had to keep a certain GPA in order to keep this scholarship flowing. And my mother and father were much more concerned about my GPA than I was. But I learned after my second semester that there were things I had to do to arrange my school schedule in order to keep that GPA like .0001 above the threshold. And so if I was taking two science classes that semester, I better take three Bible classes. If I was taking two bath classes, I need one philosophy and two theology classes because I was going to get an A in one and less than an A in the others. <laughs> My dad likes to say no search committee ever asked for my GPA, and I'm so glad this church didn't either. Because when it came to science, Jeff is not a scholar. Man, give me Bible classes all day. I can do that. And I would arrange and fudge and do everything I could to just keep above the line in order to continue to earn my credits. Now, that's probably wise for keeping your scholarship. But it's a terrible way to relate to God. It's a terrible way to relate to God. Do we ever have hidden brokenness that we keep quiet and then overcompensate with our goodness somewhere else? Do you ever take secret sin that you don't want to let anybody know about and you work so hard to keep it under the surface that at some point it all blows up? Merit is a terrible religion. I'm here to tell you, you know what a great faith is? God's mercy. Because it's not dependent on you. It is an embrace you did not ask for. It is an embrace you did not deserve. It is an embrace that is not dependent on how good or healthy or righteous you are. It is dependent on God's faithfulness and not your unfaithfulness. This is who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus indiscriminately walks down the street, bumps into a tax collector that nobody likes and says, why don't you come and follow me? And in that experience, he began, to bring, he began to bring so many more people with him that we are still here to this day because we follow a God who desires mercy and not sacrifice. Many years ago, I was at SeaWorld in San Antonio. Anybody ever been to any SeaWorld? This was back when they could have the killer whales, you know, there and there before they made that movie and took down the whole industry. I don't know if you watched that one. Um, I remember going to SeaWorld, and you're, they have that huge outdoor arena. And when you get to about row seven, before you get down to the water, there are these huge signs that say, we guarantee between the seventh row in the water that if you sit here, 
you will be covered with water. You will be covered with water. There was almost like a business promise that you would be drenched. There was a warning that you would be drenched if you got too close. My friends, I think we need to put that same warning on Scripture. That when you crack open God's Word, we're here to warn you. You get too close, you are going to be drenched with mercy. You are going to be covered with grace. God is going to shatter all of your expectations of merit and earning and good enoughs and oughts and musts and shoulds. God is going to immerse you in mercy. So be careful, people, if you get too close. Maybe we don't only need that on the Bible. Maybe we hopefully need that on the sign at our door. Folks, you come here. You come here long enough. We are going to drench you in mercy. We are going to drench you in welcome. We are going to immerse you in mercy, not sacrifice. Because the gospel is about how merciful God is. The church we pray is about how merciful God is. It is not about your merit. It is about God's mercy and I'm here to tell you that ought to have gratitude on your lips every morning when you wake up because you're going to mess it up and God loves you anyway. God loves you anyway. It's not simplistic but it is very, very simple. It's not about what you earn. It's about God's faithfulness. The unhealthy Sinful people like me. My dad taught me this so many years ago. When I was in college, I remember going back to my home church where I later became the pastor. And my dad shared with me over lunch one Sunday after worship how excited he was for Mother's Day that year. In that church at First Christian Church in Keokuk, Iowa, they dedicated all of their babies from the last year on one Sunday. On one Sunday. It's kind of a Midwest Protestant tradition. And all of the young babies that had been born into the church that year were invited to come up with their parents, receive a little baby Bible, receive a blessing. And my dad loved it because it would just bloat the crowd. Everybody and their cousin would come to see children and grandchildren dedicated. He said, Jeff, I... I did something I might be in a little hot water for, but I don't care. I'm like, well, well, do speak, Father. <laughs> he said, um, there's a church out on the edge of town that will remain nameless, and I knew what church he was talking about. And they had two women that were pregnant that were not married to the father and were not married when the baby was born. And that church informed them that on their Mother's Day baby dedication, they were not welcomed to come forward and to have their child dedicated. And so my dad said, I put the word out on the street. I'll dedicate every single baby that shows up at this church. I will dedicate every single baby that shows up at this church. Now I'm here to tell you that some Pharisees and religious leaders inside his church and outside his church were not happy about it. But he said something to me that stuck. He said, son, why don't we just start chasing after the people that Jesus chased after? Why don't we just start welcoming the people that Jesus welcomed? And anybody that's in that difficult situation, we don't need to sugarcoat it. Being a single mom is tough. Shouldn't they have the embrace of the church? rather than the rejection of the church? The easiest way to grow a church is to start welcoming all the people that all the other churches don't want. But in doing that, you'll not only grow your church, you're going to end up a lot more like Jesus. Good religion. Binding us together to God and to one another. What is good religion, James says? That we would care for the widows and the orphans and extend wealth, health, welcome, and hospitality to people 
in need. This time I want to give you an invitation to respond to the Jesus that is inviting you to follow Him. If you would like to make Lindenwood Christian Church your church home, if you would like to make your confession of faith and talk about what it means to be baptized, as we prepare to stand and sing this song to close our sermon, I invite you to make your way into the back. Mike Taylor, one of our elders, will welcome you into our church and walk you through the process of making this your church home. Or maybe you're just sitting right where you are. When we stand to sing this song in just a moment, maybe you need to cross a threshold in your heart that lets go of all of the bad religion you've been clinging to in the past and embraces the God that is embracing you. But whatever you do this morning, don't stay right where you are. Jesus is calling. He's calling you to follow Him in ways that are pure, in ways that build up, in ways that don't tear down. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank You that You offer us this safe space to push away all the voices in our mind that say we're not enough. We're grateful, oh God, that we can let go of all of the lies that tell us we will never measure up. Oh God, we take comfort that Your mercy is stronger than anything else in this world. And that in, call, in answering Your call to follow us, we find freedom, we find growth, and we find we have something to offer this hurting world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand where you are.